Welcome to our sweet bird analysis as we move on to our final act, Act 3, Scene 1, which we I will discuss in two parts. Let's begin as we often do by looking at the stage directions of the setting. In a way, we are coming back full circle. We're back in the same hotel room and the principal characters in this scene are just chants and princes like they were in Act 1, Scene 1. But a lot has changed. Now do keep in mind that all of this happened in one day, from Easter morning to Easter evening. But now that we're approaching the end of the day, things have seemed to go from bad to worse. So notice, for example, that the shutters are open to the Palm Garden, and that should be a very positive, calming, serene picture, especially at nighttime. But as is often the case with the characters, when they look out, it tends to be something negative and remorseful. Now it's very ominous as well because there's something burning in the background. Tennessee Williams doesn't tell us exactly what it is. It could be another effigy of Boss Finley or some kind of emblem, but there's a lot of chaos outside. So clearly the rally didn't go according to Boss's plan. There's a lot of turmoil. Many people support him, but some people do not, and they see him as corrupt. And so that burning is an indication of that. However, that does not mean Chance is safe, because when an animal's under threat and Boss definitely feels like that, it is likely they're going to attack even worse. So Chance's life is very much still endangered. The other thing, though, is that the palms are mentioned again. The one thing that's constantly projected is the royal palms now against the skyline, the dark skyline. So there's still some hope for some kind of redemption or a, a rebirth. It is Easter, so the audience expects that. We're just not quite sure how it's going to work out and for who. Now Princess compares Chance to a former co-star. This is a new conceit that she has not brought up before, but it's going to be pivotal in understanding Princess in the, this last scene. Interestingly, they, they've switched roles from the last scene where Princess was out of control, seemed deeply under the influence, spouting things, at random without much sense or logic, now it's Chance who's acting that way. And Princess is telling me, telling him, there's no way you can drive, you're in no state to drive. And she goes back to what she had said earlier about feeling something for him, feeling a sense of empathy when he came back defeated. I felt something in my heart for you, which I thought I couldn't feel. I remembered young men who were what you are. So this is what brings up this former co-star of hers, Chance, has not had the chance to bud in his acting or modeling career. And this reminds her of another young man that at first she can't recall the name, but then it comes to her, France, France Albertson. She, he was a co-star that was so nervous that he held on to her too tight during a waltz scene and actually dislocated a disc. So his career went nowhere. And she feels like this man was a warning sign for chance unless he changes. So she is trying to help him out here. And to make matters worse, she explains to Chance what happened to France after. After he could no longer become a star, he became a gigolo, much like Chance. And Princess saw him in Monte Carlo with a woman 70 years old. And yet she emphasizes the fact that it was France's eyes that looked much older. So selling his soul for an easy lifestyle cost him his life, cost him his youth. And she has this excellent simile that he was led around by this woman with an invisible chain, like a blind, dying lapdog. He was a pet used for someone else's purposes. And even though there was no physical, visible chain, it was there nonetheless, depleting him of any purpose as a human being. And then he dies tragically, apparently, by a suicide, which she phrases through a question. They say that he was in the Grand Coronation. There's a picture of that here. That's in the south of France, so a very elite, beautiful area, but with all these twisting, winding roads very close to the shore. And she says that he broke his skull like an eggshell. I wonder what they found in it. Oh, despaired of ambitions, little treacheries, possibly even little attempts at blackmail. Notice the hyphens to separate accidentally, question mark. Obviously, infer, leading the audience to infer that he committed suicide because his life had become void of any kind of real meaning. 
And then what Princess really wants to emphasize is that Chance could be this very young man in the not too near future. Because when she describes that he broke his skull like an eggshell, she speaks metaphorically how inside that eggshell, inside this man's poor life, were just ambitions that weren't fulfilled, little treacheries, and blackmail. And we know that Chance fits all of those criteria. He had all this ambition that was unfulfilled, leaving him desperate to attempt anything, even blackmail, to get it back. Chance is not listening. He's pulling away. This makes sense. If people close to him, especially Aunt Nani, and even Miss Lucy, who at least knew him when he was a young man, can't get into his goal to leave St. Cloud before something terrible happens to him, why would princes, where they've had this kind of hostile relationship from the get-go? But I want to focus more on comparison to an eggshell. It seems really callous and uncaring for princes to compare a young man's suicide to something like an egg. But we've seen her deal with reality with fantastical elements. Remember when she described her retirement as retiring to the dead planet, the moon, or when she talked about the tiger inside of her. Or very recently in the last scene when she described chance like Jack from Jack and the Beanstalk. Well, now she's bringing up another fairy tale illusion, this time to Humpty Dumpty. Chance doesn't want to hear it. I didn't have to. I told you that story this morning. I'm not going to drive off nothing and crack my egg like an eggshell. He doesn't think he's at all like this young France that Princess is trying to compare him to. But Princess insists, yes, yes, you are. Now, the reason for Humpty Dumpty is that it allows Princess to deal with harsh elements of reality in a way that her actress self can better understand through a storyline. But the story of Humpty Dumpty has no happy ending. Humpty Dumpty is never put back together again. And she's trying to warn him through these fantastical comparisons that the same thing could happen to you. And that his only real chance of saving himself is to follow her, kind of become like, not escort, because she says she won't do that to him anymore, but kind of like a personal assistant. But it's not a very convincing case because she's saying, let me lead you by that invisible chain through Carlton's and Ritz's and Grand Hotels. I'll take you through all these fancy hotels. We'll live a life of luxury. But by comparing it to the same simile of being led by an invisible chain, she's basically offering slavery to chance you'll be like my dog like my pretty thing that i can trail around me and if it didn't end well with france since he committed suicide why would this be a good option for chance so she's trying to help him but not really offering an option that seems worthwhile and so the audience is not surprised that chance denies it and says don't you know i die first recall what he told aunt nani that if he can't be with Heavenly, if he can't be accepted back in St. Cloud, then he's lost his home, he's lost his heart. Because Heavenly is his home. Heavenly is his soul and his heart. Without her, without being able to be with her, he's homeless and he'd rather be dead. Which will help explain some of the decisions he makes at the end of this last scene. Then something really pivotal happens with Princess she learns what really happened in her comeback film. Remember we discussed this in our teens meeting that it felt like her rendition of what happened in that event was probably not absolutely true. And Williams presents some stage directions to indicate we will learn the truth. Notice Princess moves out on the fore stage. So she comes to the front of the stage. All surrounding areas dim till nothing is clear behind her but the palm garden. So all we see is Princess and the projections of the palm trees. So now we're going to get some truth. Everything else dims out. Also, there's a hint that maybe princes will be reborn since palm trees tend to connote a symbolic equivalence of everlasting life. So something positive could happen to her. And what happens is that Chance picks up the phone to call Sally Powers, that really powerful Hollywood reporter that could put anyone in the map. They were going to use her for the scheme that he came up with about this supposed movie. Princess at first is aghast and notice she breaks the fourth wall. She talks directly to the audience by saying, why did I give him that number? And she starts saying, 
I'm breathing freely, which is so crucial because remember in the first act, she woke up demanding oxygen and explaining that she needs something to calm her nerves and drive away the panic because she feels weightless without her career. That's gone now. So instead of being panic stricken, she is really serene at the moment because Chance, Chance is doing the things she couldn't do. She's picked up the phone to call Sally before and has not been able to do it to follow through. Now he's doing the things she could never do. Kind of like when you don't want to see your Cambridge scores, right, in August. Um, or when you're a senior and you're getting applications, you want someone else to open that email for you. Same kind of thing, but in more dramatic circumstances, of course. Notice again, she's breaking up the fourth wash because she says, the light's on me. Well, it literally is because of the stage production quality right now. So she's drawing attention to the fact this is a play. So that's William's fantastical ways that he plays with reality on display. However, we start to get a sense that this isn't going to be good for chance, because notice what she says. It's only this call I care for. I seem to be standing in light, once again breaking the fourth wall, with everything else dimmed out. He's in the dimmed out background as if he never left the obscurity he was born in. So all of a sudden, we went from a woman who was willing to help him out to someone who's willing to forget chance much like she was at the beginning when she belittled him and said, oh, you're not very good at blackmail. I, I can see you're not well suited for acting. We, we see a resurface of that, which is a bit surprising. And her confidence is back. I was born to own it as he was born to make this phone call for me to Sally Powers. How condescending. She was born to be a star while Chance was just born to pick up a phone. So it clearly indicates that if she's interested at chance at all, it is only for what he can do for her. And for the audience, it's frustrating because we thought we were seeing character development in the last scene when she says she could empathize. But once there's a spark that maybe her film career can truly come back, she is so quick to let go of chance. And she calls herself a legend and more importantly, calls herself a monster again. Monsters don't die early, they hang on long. Think of a horror movie, right? The monster doesn't get killed off in the first scene. It builds and builds and builds until the very end. So she's feeling, I have a lot more to me. There's a lot more to my career than I had given myself credit, credit for. But she realizes this is something corrupt in her character. Because notice at the end, she says, almost as infinite as their disgust with themselves. So even though there's a hope now for her return, she realizes it also means that she's becoming the monster that she had hoped she wouldn't. And it does disgust her. So she is self-aware of that. So we do have to consider that when we discuss her. Then the lighting changes. The lights turn back on once the phone rings. And it turns out that her comeback career was actually received really, we really well. When Sally Powers is asking Princess on the other line, did you read any reviews? Where did you go? Have you talked to anybody? And Princess says no to all of these. She doesn't admit why she left. She says she left because people were laughing in the wrong places in the movie and that embarrassed her. We know that's not true. We know that she left because of her close-up and she got embarrassed of how old she looked. Notice how Chance is trying to interrupt. So there's a lot of stage directions where he's talking to himself, he's gripping her arm, he's trying anything to break through to her, but it's not working. Princess is just fixated on talking to Sally Powers. There's a little bit of panic coming in. She's breathless. And she repeats that later. Oh, oxygen, oxygen. Um, but for the most part, this is a very positive turn of events for her career. It turns out that the reviews have been saying that as she's aged, her acting has grown, it has more depth, and she can't believe it, and she's just gushing. While Chance is hissing at her, seizes her by the hair, and even calls her the B word. So a, a very sharp contrast with a positive turn of events for her and negative turn of events for him that makes him desperate to do anything to turn it around, but it doesn't seem like he will.